Uh, I'm Joe Massey. For those of you who weren't in the first session, I'm uh, chairman of Global Health at Elmhurst Hospital and connected with Mount Sinai through the COVID-19, uh, Cure-19 partnership uh, with Mount Sinai. This next portion of our um, presentation today and our discussion today includes uh, two uh, world famous uh, global health experts that come to these issues from a, a different and very fascinating set of backgrounds. Uh, first, Lori Garrett. Uh, she wrote her best selling book, The Coming Plague Novel Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance, while she was dividing her time between the Harvard School of Public Health and New York Newsday in the 1992 uh, 1993 academic years. She was a fellow at Harvard, where she worked closely with the Emerging Disease Group collection of faculty uh, concerned about the surge in epidemics of previously unknown or rare viruses and bacteria. The book was published in hard copy by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux in 1994, and it spent 19 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It was released in paperback in 1995 by uh, Viking Penguin, and in Coming Plague remains uh, in print and continues to sell vigorously, and I can tell you it continues to sell extremely vigorously among healthcare professionals and medical students in particular. During the 1990s, uh, Lori continued to uh, track outbreaks and epidemics worldwide, noting the insufficient response from the global public health institutions in Zaire, India, Russia, and most of the former USSR, Eastern Europe, and the United States. This resulted in the publication in 2000 of her next book, Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health. It was released by Hyperion that year and was in paperback in 2001. Betrayal of Trust was also a vigorous bestseller and it remains in print today. It was also released as an ebook in May 2011. Lori received the Pulitzer Prize for Explanatory Journalism for her coverage of the 1995 Ebola outbreak in Sub Saharan Africa. And in the summer of 2011, her uh, third long awaited book, I Heard the Sirens Scream How Americans Responded to the 9 11 and Anthrax Attacks was published in time for the 10th anniversary of 9-11 by Amazon as an ebook. Lori has been a member of the World Economic Forum Global Health Security Advisory Board, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and the National Association of Science Writers. She helped create the Noguchi Africa Prize and has uh, three times served as a judge, and she's listed as a twice-ever Cassandra in uh, warnings. Um, this is a, a unique designation, uh, identifying people who are wisely appointing to the issues that we confront. Dr. Daniel Lucy, uh, MD, MPH, is a physician who's traveled to epidemics every year since 2003, specifically the SARS pandemic in China and Canada, MERS in the Middle East and South Korea, Ebola in Sierra Leone and Liberia with Doctors Without Borders, Nipah in Malaysia and Bangladesh, flu in Indonesia and Egypt, HIV in Uganda and South Africa, Zika in Brazil, yellow fever in uh, DR Congo, chikungunya in Pakistan, plague in Madagascar, and of course, COVID-19 in China starting in February. In August 2014, uh, he proposed uh, an exhibit on uh, epidemics at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington. After years of collaborative work with his Smithsonian colleagues, it opened in 2018. The exhibit includes many of the above outbreaks from a perspective of human, animal, and environmental one health. Since January 6, 2020, he's written over 75 blogs on COVID-19 for the Infectious Disease Society of America. I read these blogs uh, basically every day. In the initial blog, he stated that the new pneumonia is a WHO-defined disease X. In January 25th uh, blog, he hypothesized that the Wuhan seafood market was not the origin of the virus. Uh, in December 2019. And in uh, July 8th, the New York Times cited his June 30th blog on eight questions that the WHO uh, team going to China should ask to help find the origin of this virus. Now he blogs on various vi uh, virus variants and vaccines. He teaches at Dartmouth and at Georgetown. He has taught about epidemics for the last 20 years. He trained at UCSF and San Francisco General and at Harvard. As a fellow and MPH, he was an attending physician at the National Institutes of Health, as chief of infectious diseases at the 900-bed Washington Hospital Center. During 9-11, he helped provide care in the burn unit to patients from the Pentagon and helped coordinate the DC response to the anthrax attacks. Later, he went to Sverdlovsk in Russia to meet with physicians from the 1979 anthrax outbreak. So welcome you both. Uh, it's great to have you both. Um, the uh, first question, uh, 
I'll, I'll direct this to Lori, and then we'll uh, move on with the same questions to uh, Daniel. Lori, as a world-renowned global health expert and double Cassandra, I know you've been trying to get the world and the fields of global and public health to listen and improve for some time. Can you please summarize your thoughts and response in a 10 to 15 minutes? Our primary question today, what must we learn from this pandemic to prevent future pandemics? And what lessons are you most concerned that we won't heed? Lori? There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Sorry, after all the Zooms that all of us have done, that was a sign of gross incompetence on my part. <laughs> um, and I feel like we should have heard your bio, for God's sake. But thank you very much for that very generous in, uh, introduction. And I do have some very strong feelings, as you can imagine, about your question. Um, and I'll try to plow through really quickly. At this time last year, we were watching the situation unfold in China. And uh, we saw a transition occur from a kind of cover up, a, a, the big lie, the, oh, it's no big deal. It's not in any way connected to anything. Don't worry about it, world to Xi Jinping personally stepping in and ordering the state council to fire pretty much everybody who'd been in charge in Wuhan and Hubei and take over a, a, an all of government response that was massive, the like of which seriously, historically has never been seen even in 2003 SARS. And I was in the middle of China in 2003 in the SARS epidemic, traveled all over the country and I saw initially that China unfolded according to that playbook, the same response. They started out by reacting to this virus the way they did to SARS 2003. Shut down cities, set up roadblocks, fever checks everywhere, giant quarantine centers set up, massive infectious disease hospitals built like five days, six days. And what I saw unfolding, I thought, wow, we can never do a single one of these things in the United States of America. If this is what it's gonna to take to stop this virus, we've already failed because we can't build a hospital in seven days. We can't build a hospital hardly in seven years. We can't do massive roadblocks across America because a huge percentage of America carries guns in their cars and would blast any government official trying to tell them what to do. We can't um, do, mandate quarantine, we'll have the libertarians and, you know, Rand Paul will lead the charge and that will fall apart. And step by step, we watch China take step measures that should have been, uh, you know, a clarion call to the whole world. Whoa, pay attention. This is not an easy bug to control. But we were smug and not just the United States, almost the whole world was smug, except China's immediate neighbors who had had more than enough experience with China underplaying the nature of its outbreaks and had gone through SARS. And they also went to their playbook from 2003 SARS and said, where did we go wrong that time? Let's jump fast and make sure we don't repeat those mistakes. And that included a lot of nosocomial transmission. In the case of SARS, it was a really big hospital spreader. And so all across Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, you saw governments say, whoa, -oh, this might be SARS. Let's review our hospitals, infection control standards, our surveillance systems. Let's jump on this and be ready. Um, meanwhile, you know, we were in year two of a really vicious trade war between the United States and China. And it was almost immediate that uh, Donald Trump went from, I'm in Davos with Xi, he's got the situation under control, nothing to worry about, to let's call it the China virus. And so we now flash forward to a situation where any uh, actual uh, breakthrough, any wisdom from China must be ignored. It cannot be uh, a, a possibility that America will acknowledge that China might have done something right. So we are not learning from the Chinese experience. We are utterly and completely ignoring and condemning it. Uh, meanwhile, they're having uh, a resurgence. And if we were paying attention right now, we would see that 75 million Chinese are under quarantine, that they uh, are responding with tremendous haste and lockdown to a handful, really, of cases, comparatively speaking. And they will bring it under control. 
and their GDP growth is the highest in the world, and their economy is pretty much going full steam. While we are at more than 26 million cases, and our economy is really suffering. Okay, so where what are the big take homes from all of this? First of all, we have a huge hubris problem in the United States and all of Europe does as well. We always have assumed that infectious disease threats that are that would be significant would come from over there, not here. And we, our great wisdom, our ma massive, fabulous scientific expertise and everything, we would act as the great teachers. We would share our health security uh, expertise, our laboratory skills with those poor, beleaguered, you know, underprivileged post-colonial societies, especially in Africa. And um, I, our notion of public health was completely different between global health and public health inside the USA. So on the global health front, we were all about poor people. We were all about poor economies. But nationally, we have completely demeaned our public health infrastructure. We have uh, nothing but disdain for it. And everything is about medicine. Everything's about organized medicine, organized hospitals, uh, healthcare for the rich, uh, healthcare for the insured, and then uh, kind of poverty uh, charity programs for the rest. Um, and we also have always assumed that um, there would be silver bullets. You know, any outbreak, if it really did spill over here, we would find a cure really fast. We would find a drug that worked. We would get a vaccine out in record time, which we have in fact done this time. Um, and we would have, uh, you know, what was necessary to, to bring it under control. So shock and awe for us is to discover, no, we don't have a supply chain for anything. We can't even get N95 masks supplied. We can't even get hospital gowns where they need to be. Shock and awe is, no, we can't develop rapid diagnostic tests. We're, we're a complete flummox at this. And shock and awe is discovering that we don't know the difference between a hospital medical test to confirm a diagnosis that will, will uh, guide treatment options um, versus a mass surveillance skill test that will allow public health to understand the prevalence, incidence, and directional uh, flow trends of our own outbreak versus an antibody test that will tell us where has the virus been? How is it moving in our society? We don't have any of this. So where are we now? We're with, with uh, totally non-standardized tests. You can't compare one test to another. We, we have no idea what any of our data means. What does 26 million positive tests mean? We're misreporting it every day. Does that mean 26 million human beings have had COVID? Does that mean 12 million have been tested positive twice or three times? I mean, we have no idea. And we get down to the level of our fundamental problem in America with all of this that you know we keep hearing rhetorically, but we do nothing about is that we have not only don't have a national health system, we have a system that's been built with organized medicine on top, trammeling to death public health. So, you know, your average public health MD, PhD is paid, you know, this much compared to your average cardiac surgeon. Um, your average public health person has a budget to work with that perhaps for a whole city is less than one hospital's budget. Uh, your average public health person is still using fax machines and Windows 98 to try and send uh, test results and uh, feed data on hospitalization rates and everything we need to know about what's going on in our epidemic. We get to a situation such as we have here in New York where um, the whole public health apparatus was shaken up and taken over under our mayor by the hospital corporation. And so we have now no, no clear delineation between where organized medicine starts and where public health ends. It's all one giant glom with, public, with organized medicine on top uh, and the hospital administrators on top. Um, bottom line, I think, as we go forward is, we have always assumed when outbreaks occurred that there was a strategy and somebody was in charge and there was a chain of command. And if there wasn't a strategy and a chain of command, then that became the, the thing that had to be addressed immediately. 
And that was a typical, in outbreaks that uh, Dr. Lucy and I have been in all over the world, it's typical that one of the first steps of a WHO intervention is to push the national government, the national responders to actually uh, agree on what's the strategic goal and how do we get there? Some chain of command and some set of target interventions. We've never done that with this epidemic. We haven't done that nationally, we haven't done that locally, and we haven't done it globally. We have no strategy. There is absolutely no agreed upon strategic target. Are we after eradication of the virus? Are we after elimination of threat to our own personal being even at the expense of another 2 billion human beings on planet Earth because we deny them access to the tools that we use to bring ours under control? Are we after just reopen the economy? We have no agreed strategy or target. And that's where we are today, a complete chaotic mess. I hand it to you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thanks very much, Lori. Uh, you have given a stark and uh, convincing uh, description of where, where everything stands right now. And it is going to be an enormous challenge to really do anything that is um, effective and that actually sticks in between crises like this. So let me next uh, turn to Dan Lucy. Um, Dan, um, he and I have worked together uh, in a number of ways. He's come to our hospital to do presentations on global health and uh, it's great to have him back again. So Dan, let me start you with the, uh, the question I started uh, Lori with. Um, can you, uh, what must we learn from this pandemic to prevent future pandemics? First, I'd like to say thank you very much, uh, Joe, for the invitation to join uh, your four hour uh, webinar today. Uh, and uh, also I'd like to thank Lori for saying most of my points, which just goes to show that uh, I think uh, that uh, 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 you know, being on the ground, if you will, uh, whether it's in China and SARS or Ebola in West Africa, where just briefly, it was the only time that Lori and I ever uh, literally crossed paths uh, at the Doctors Without Borders facility in October 2014 in Monrovia in Liberia. I was working there with patients, hands-on care, and I was going out uh, uh, of the, uh, the checkpoint, if you will, where we get uh, bleached going out and, and bleach coming in uh, on our shoes at least. And, uh, and I saw Lori and I said, uh, 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 the next plague is already here. The, sort of a take from her book uh, from 1994, which I read way back then. And, uh, and I using in a class that I'm teaching tomorrow night at, at uh, uh, Dartmouth uh, about epidemics. So uh, Joe, I'd like to start with just uh, uh, three, what I consider uh, sort of overarching lessons that uh, I think, uh, applied to this pandemic, but in general, I think could be applicable to uh, all uh, pandemics or the term I like to use is pan epidemics. So I don't have to get into any uh, linguistic arguments about well, what's a pandemic and what's an epidemic. And uh, so pan epidemics, if you will. Um, and, and so the three lessons are, are each just three words. Uh, and the first one is anticipate, recognize and act. Three verbs, anticipate, recognize and act. Um, the second, Again, with um, my hat off to uh, Lori, um, because she used the key word here, one of the three words. So the, the second lesson is humility, not hubris. And the third is synergy of strengths. Then what I would say from a, a tactical or an operational or, well, what does all that mean? How do you translate it into reality? Um, what uh, I would offer as as um, a lesson for this pandemic and those still to come, again, whether it's you know, large outbreaks or small outbreaks or epidemics, pan epidemics or pandemics. And, and that is uh, this, uh, what's next is already here. We just haven't recognized it yet. And uh, that's a phrase I've used for many years. And it appears at the final section of the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History here in Washington uh, the exhibition on, on epidemics, all of which are viruses that come from animals. So viral zoonotic epidemics and the, the final um, large plaque on the wall, and it, and it looks something like this, 
and, and basically it says, where in the world are outbreaks occurring? And my answer is that they're already occurring, um, but we haven't recognized them yet. And I think that's very important in terms of um, mobilizing everything that we need to do and that we rarely, if ever, have done in the past and most flagrantly failed to do with this pandemic. Um, so how about specific examples? Um, I would argue that, you know, uh, that it's important to study the past, uh, the past is prologue, but that when we're dealing with a brand new uh, disease, an infectious disease, uh, that there could well be, and there has been this pandemic due to the SARS coronavirus 2 virus, um, unprecedented, truly new um, uh, aspects of the virus and the pandemic that by relying only on lessons from the past, um, we've made false analogies. Um, uh, and, and I would argue that one is by comparing uh, this virus and this pandemic to uh, influenza viruses and influenza pandemics. Um, and, and particularly with regard to asymptomatic spread or spread by people who have no symptoms or minimal symptoms, uh, whether it's before they develop symptoms or if they never develop symptoms. In terms of respiratory viruses, uh, that has, to my knowledge, never been the predominant mode of spread. And uh, that was argued that that would therefore not be the case with this virus by leading U.S very high ranking leading uh, US, uh, highly respected US researchers. Um, uh, and, and I certainly agree that wasn't the case in the past, but it is to a too far a degree, too large a degree the case now. So um, in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to give some specific examples. I think that um, a, a major uh, failing, and I think it's uh, in line with what uh, Lori said, and, it, and in my view, it goes to the um, humility, not hubris uh, uh, lesson, uh, is that we didn't learn the lessons that uh, Hong Kong, uh, mainland China, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, South Korea, uh, and, and other countries were, were showing us uh, from the beginning, whether on the websites of the uh, Wuhan uh, um, uh, Health Commission or even the National Health Commission or the China CDC in their weekly, China CDC weekly uh, publications, um, but also in the medical literature. And so before China officially, the Beijing government put a, uh, a clamp down on any publications uh, about the epidemic or about the origins of the epidemic uh, having to be approved by the central government, uh, a large number of very important papers were published in English in mainstream uh, Western medical journals like The Lancet, The New England Journal of Medicine, the um, Journal of the American Medical Association, and they provided very, very helpful information, but we didn't pay attention, in part because of, I think we didn't have enough humility. Uh, we, we thought that, well, you know, what, what's happening over there? Uh, it's sort of like SARS in 2003, it's not going to come here. You know, no, no one in the United States died of SARS coronavirus 1 in 2003 in America. Um, they did in Toronto, uh, you know, where I worked at Scar Scarborough General Hospital uh, during SARS in June of 2003. Um, no American has ever died of uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, the other uh, coronavirus that causes pneumonia and systemic disease, along with SARS prior to this one, prior to COVID. And I'm afraid that we uh, just assumed that the past was prologue and we didn't need to worry very much about uh, what was happening in, in China and then very soon in, in other countries with regard to this pandemic. Um, another lesson is that, uh, you know, China reported in public information that the virus had spread to all 31 of their provinces and most of their major cities um, very early on. Uh, Wuhan is a high-speed train hub uh, for all of China, uh, as well as having a, a large international uh, uh, airport. Um, so the virus traveled uh, in, in the bodies of people, uh, particularly right before their uh, Chinese Lunar New Year. Um, but we really didn't pay attention. Um, and most importantly, we didn't act. Um, we didn't rec recognize the significance and we didn't act as a result. Uh, so just to touch very briefly, I, I some specific examples. Uh, December 31st of 2019, Hong Kong put up a dedicated website 
to this epidemic um, and, and started testing people who came to Hong Kong from Wuhan. Uh, and they made public the results of that testing every day. Um, uh, they sent out a letter on December 31st to all the doctors in, in Hong Kong calling their attention to this new uh, pneumonia, which in December 31st wasn't known to be due to an infectious disease agent, let alone a coronavirus, but, but soon thereafter was, was uh, recognized. Um, uh, Lord Yara was already writing, I think it was January 8th, in Foreign Policy, something that I read uh, as soon as it came out. Uh, so she did recognize the significance of what was unfolding, um, but not many Americans did. And uh, soon thereafter, though, on Friday, January the 24th of last year, um, in The Lancet, there were two papers published uh, by Chinese colleagues. Uh, and, and one basically presented evidence that was clear to me that the virus did not start in that seafood market in December. Um, and, and I wrote about that uh, that day on my blog. And the next day, Sunday the 26th, uh, John Cohen from Science wrote an article that he he posted online that night, and I had dozens of emails overnight from people around the world, uh, uh, some friendly, some very unfriendly, about you know my position that uh, uh, the virus didn't start in that market, and that had that has significance. Uh, at the same time, there was a paper published from Hong Kong investigators in Shenzhen describing a family Shenzhen, a large city in the mainland, right on the border of Hong Kong, that said that uh, there was transmission within a family. Uh, including in a asymptomatic member of the family. Uh, so that, again, was a very important writing on the wall, if you will, um, uh, that, that, that we didn't read or we didn't understand the significance of or, or what we need to do. Very soon after, uh, and this is one of the last two examples I'll give, and then we'll go to discussion. Um, uh, on, on Wednesday, January the 29th of 2020, a year ago, the New England Journal of Medicine published a paper with 40, approximately 44 uh, maybe 45 authors from China, including George Fu Gao or Gao Fu, the uh, director general of the China CDC, the main one in Beijing, um, who I know from work in Sierra Leone and uh, uh, Ebola work in 2014. I respect him a lot. Um, and, and, and also the Dean of the School of Public Health in Hong Kong, uh, Gabriel Luong was another co-author. And basically they said very clearly and explicitly that and again, this is January 29th last year. They said that by mid-December, there was person-to-person -person spread of this virus going on. Uh, for me, again, that's, that's, a, that's a very loud rocket explosion. Uh, it's more than a red flag, and uh, we really didn't appreciate what that meant. And the last example I want to give is that um, it wasn't until January 20th that China admitted that there were at least some healthcare workers infected. Um, 14 in total, one hospital, one neurosurgical unit, one difficult intubation. But for me, that was the writing on the wall. Up until then, China said, you can't get healthcare workers or healthcare workers haven't been infected. And I just thought that was so strange. How can that be the case? Many uh, 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 thousands of healthcare workers were infected in 2003 around the world, mostly in Hong Kong, uh, but also in Toronto and Singapore and elsewhere with SARS coronavirus one. Um, so it just really wasn't plausible that they weren't being infected, healthcare workers weren't being infected with SARS coronavirus too. Turns out they were, China just wasn't telling us about it. Uh, so the landmark uh, publication was uh, on February 14th, a Friday last year, I was in Hong Kong. I read it, my heart sank. It said that there were 1,716 confirmed healthcare worker infections and probably over 3,000 total that weren't lab confirmed uh, or, or some number that weren't lab confirmed, but 1,716 were. So I, I wrote something in her blog and I sent it to many people, uh, not to Lori, we didn't, I didn't know her, but uh, uh, to many people, uh, you know, in, in DC and Bethesda in Atlanta and Seattle and San Francisco and New York City, uh, including some uh, prominent medical journalists. And there was just silence. Um, to me, this was the most important, and I'm bi biased as a healthcare worker, but it was the most important definitive evidence that there was person to person spread. And what was going to happen is what unfolded in terms of spread in the community, spread in the hospitals, healthcare workers being infected and dying, whether it was Italy or elsewhere in Europe or home or elsewhere in Iran or Brazil or the United States or, or anyone else. So if you look at the US CDC's website, as of yesterday, uh, healthcare personnel, uh, they said that there's over 350,000 that have been infected and over uh, 1,250 that have been, that have died. And, and those are 
as they say, um, um, uh, under 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 estimates um, due to inadequate reporting. So thank you again for the opportunity to join you today. And, uh, and I turn it back to you, Joe. Thanks so much, Dan. I think um, I want to start with some straightforward questions for each of you, uh, and then I want to try an overarching question. And just to give you a little um, uh, time to think about that one, the overarching question is: Okay, let's pretend that we have control over everything in the world. What concrete steps would we actually take at this point uh, to prepare the world for the next pandemic? So before we get to that one, um, what are you most concerned about? Lori, let me direct this one to you again. Uh, what are you most concerned about among questions like the vaccine rollout, viral resistance, uh, the whole world out of balance uh, situation you've written so much about? Uh, what about the vaccine? What what in that uh, process are you most concerned about right now? Well, of course, all, all aspects of distribution are a disaster. There's only really two countries that are doing well with vaccine distribution, Bahrain and Israel. And they have unique situations in both countries. Uh, everywhere in the world we're struggling. And now we have huge nationalist battles over who gets Pfizer and who gets Moderna and who gets Sinovac and who gets and go down the list. Um, and I think all this is just going to get worse. But what really worries me, what wakes me up in the middle of the night, literally, and I jump out of bed and start scribbling notes uh, because of the nightmares that I've been having is uh, I think we're already seeing significant evidence that this particular form of uh, SARS the coronavirus is more prone to selection pressure than anything we've seen with its predecessor SARS or with MERS. I mean, basically MERS is an unchanged virus. It's been in circulation now for a, uh, almost a decade and uh, we haven't really seen any significant phenotypic ch uh, changes at all. Um, and the same can be said for the original SARS virus although it's not still in circulation, but during the time that it was rampant, we didn't see any serious change in that virus. But as we have to thank the UK for setting up a serious genomic surveillance system, I think most people don't realize that if you go to GISAID, which is the G-I-S-A-I-D, and just Google that and go to that website, that is the repository for now nearly four hundred thousand genomic sequences of uh, versions of this SARS-CoV-2 virus open sourced from all over the world. And most people don't realize that about 40% of those sequences come from the UK. And it's not because the UK has more virus, it's because they have massive genomic sequencing as part of the national health system. So first they have organized medicine and second they, they saw a way to put the genomic revolution into that organized medical setting. And the result is that they were the first to really spot that new variants were emerging and that they had significant impact on the epidemiology. And now we're hearing on the virulence and the mortality associated. Um, they spotted it first. Well, who has the best genomic surveillance on the African continent? South Africa. So South Africa is the second to spot uh, a, a virulent new strain or a strain that seems to be escaping the immune system. And Japan has tough genomic surveillance. They spotted it in a traveler from Brazil and then, you know, signaled that Brazil had widespread distribution that had been completely unnoticed because they had no genomic surveillance going on at all. Now, as we finally start really looking at America and keep in mind, oh, arrogant Americans, that we really only do genomic surveillance on about 0.3% of, of strains in this country. We do not routinely do this at all, at all. It's not done by the CDC. It's not done by your hospital. It's not done by anybody. It's a completely random process and it's mostly coming out of academic centers. But what we are finding is where we look, we have new variants. So we're finding previously unknown strains in Ohio, in California. We see here in New York that 
the the both the UK strain and the South Africa or the Brazil strain are here. I'm sure if we had the capacity to really look, we would find variants all over the United States because we have such a massive amount of virus and a massive amount of household transmission. Uh, uh, you know, we we have grossly underplayed the importance of household transmission. And so I, I think my, my big fear is that we will see something akin to, and I take Dr. Lucy's um, uh, note on uh, the problem with comparing this to influenza, and I think he's absolutely right. But let's remember that the 1918-1919 influenza, the bulk of all the death occurred in just six weeks in the fall of uh, 1918 after the virus mutated and went through a significant phenotypic change, not just a few little nucleotides in its RNA. And uh, this change resulted in it being far more transmissible and more virulent. Um, and I, my fear is that we are applying willy-nilly with absolutely no oversight, no surveillance of any kind. We're applying monoclonal antibodies. We're applying uh, uh, vaccines that have, you know, by definition been rushed to the market and rushed to use without a really good surveillance infrastructure to look at the impact the vaccines are having on viral populations. We're applying substandard medication that is keeping patients alive, but with virus still in their bodies and keeping them kind of giant Petri dishes, um, partially immune suppressed, cultivating viral populations. Uh, my fear in a nutshell, Joe, is that we are now doing for SARS-CoV-2 what we have been doing since the 1940s for antibiotics. We're using our tools inappropriately and inadequately and helping promote escape mutations, helping select for forms of the virus that will defy our vaccines as we eventually get more in the pipeline, that will defy our monoclonal antibody therapies, defy whatever we throw at them. And we're, we're conducting this in an atmosphere of chaotic rollout of every single intervention that we apply whether it's testing, vaccination, whatever, no serious attempt to build cohorts and follow the classic models of epidemiology 101 to, to create cohort systems for looking at the repercussions of our interventions and determining whether we're promoting a selection process. And this is, I mean, I hope I'm just being paranoid. I hope that Joe, you know, you'll have me back here a year from now and everybody will be laughing at me saying what silly ideas I had. I would love for that to be the case, but I really fear that this is where we are. So what will that mean? It means we're going to have an epidemic that's going to go on and on and on and on and on. And we as Americans will refuse to take any of the Chinese scale interventions for all our political reasons. And so we'll just continue to have this tension between our economic sector and our public health sector over which is more important, reopen the restaurants, et cetera, or you know, maintain lockdowns. And we're just gonna have this ongoing fight that you know, it'll have a slightly different flavor to it because now we have Democrats in charge, but, but we won't be doing particularly better at fundamentally stopping the epidemic. And just a final note on that is you know, the Democrats, we, we've all had such a nightmare experience with the Trump administration and all of this that we haven't been critically looking at the Democrat response. Now we have to because now they're in charge. And then, you know, the Democrats uh, go back and look at Pelosi shouting, you know, we need testing, 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 testing. They pushed for this rollout of what now is complete chaos testing so that it's disconnected from any real measure of incidence or prevalence. So we don't really know what's going on in America. We don't really know how widespread the virus is. We know it when we see the patients show up in the hospital, but we don't know at the community level what's really going on. And so testing, testing, testing without connecting it to 
some real strategic planning that says, why are you testing? Who are you testing? What's the point? It will fail. Well, now we're doing the exact same thing with vaccination. You say on the one hand, we should vaccinate all the front line, but the front line can't get on the computers and get an appointment and get a vaccine. And so uh, I just fear that the Democrats are just as likely to glom on to fairly simplistic solutions to the problem with the same pressure about trying to get the economy back uh, and will make their own set of mistakes because they also lack a large scale strategy. Wow, thanks so much for those insights, Lori. Uh, it's hard to, to disagree with anything you just said. Uh, Dan, let me, let me ask you, um, with this collision course we're on now, with slow vaccine rollout and the emergence even before the vaccine rollout began of these variant strains, there's particular concern about now the South African strain. Uh, to the point that I think Moderna is already planning on re-engineering their vaccine. Um, what, what, what's your overall view of these uh, variant strains? Are we destined to have multiple different booster now vaccines, or is this something that we don't need to be so focused on right now? Thanks, Joe. Uh, I think that the interface between the variants and the vaccines uh, uh, from a medical public health point of view and to some extent uh, an economic all of society food security point of view is the most important thing right now today uh, because I think as I believe Lori said that uh, if, if you seek you'll find if you look you'll find in other words in my view there are already multiple additional variants of concern uh, in the world and, and in my view, certainly in the United States. Um, and in the United States, uh, I, I posted a blog January 3rd, giving uh, reasons why I thought that there would be uh, major variants found in early 2021 in the United States. And that's because we have by far more confirmed infections than anyone else. Uh, so if we have 25 million approximately with these test pot, tests that are positive, uh, so South Africa had reported uh, uh, 1 million uh, uh, people infected and the UK 2.5 million. But for the reasons that Lori laid out in terms of excellent surveillance in South Africa and, and, and the UK, and also now I'd add uh, Denmark, I think just announced they're gonna sequence all of their uh, viruses. They, they, they recognize the, the, the variants of concern. Um, they, they may not, those viruses may not have even originated in those countries, but due to their great surveillance, they found them. Um, uh, so I think that there are more because, uh, because of the large number of people that are infected in our country, uh, each time somebody's infected, there's an opportunity for the virus to mutate in a way that significantly helps the virus, um, uh, and therefore, you know, doesn't help us, the, the human species. It's the virus species versus the human species. Um, secondly, there's a large population of people who are immunocompromised in the United States and of course worldwide. Um, uh, so far, the reports that I've seen of uh, long-term, meaning months long infections with the virus are in people uh, immunocompromised because of cancer, or immunocompromised because of uh, you know, autoimmune or, or rheumatologic disease. I haven't seen any reports in anyone with HIV so far, but uh, I think any kind of immunocompromise increases the risk of prolonged um, uh, infection and mutations that can occur. Uh, uh, with prolonged infection, the, 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 the perpetual battle between the pathogen and the immune system, in this case, the source coronavirus 2 in the human immune system gets played out. And then on top of that, uh, I, I think, although I don't know the numbers, uh, that the United States has as, as, as many or more people who have received um, convalescent serum or plasma that contains antibodies from people who have survived. But my understanding is that um, particularly early on, uh, the, the plasma was a varying, uh, what we call antibody titers, varying amounts of antibody uh, or of antibodies that were uh, neutralizing that killed the virus. And so in my view, that's also a potential way to select for uh, uh, an antibody resistant uh, virus. And I didn't say it then, but to me, I thought about it. And, and I, to me, it's a real issue that, uh, again, I've, I've that is that I, I'm afraid that if we give 
um, just one dose of a two dose vaccine, uh, two dose vaccine that's you know been evaluated in phase three studies for safety and efficacy and given emergency use authorization uh, in our country or in other countries uh, that we're going to run the risk of selecting for vaccine resistant viruses because there won't be a uh, high enough titer of the antibody or perhaps induce enough uh, T cells so that when the virus, some small population uh, survives uh, or is, you know, breaks through the vaccine, uh, it will be resistant to that, to, that, to that vaccine. And that would be obviously a huge disaster. So I think we do need to develop uh, new vaccines um, and I think we need to do it now. I think Moderna is the first. Uh, I think others will follow soon um, in doing so. And I would go so far as to say it's, it, it's not going to be enough just to have an annual um, COVID uh, vaccine by, again, by analogy uh, to flu vaccine, um, because I think we need to act now. We know about these three significant variants, the first found in the UK, first found in South Africa, first found in Brazil and at the airport in Japan and Brazilian travelers, uh, but there's more out there. And I think the Brazilian one is very similar to the South African one in, in terms of the mutations, especially in the receptor binding domain, uh, including uh, one or two that uh, confer antibody resistance, as well as increased contagiousness. So I think, I think there are more out there. So I think we're going to need to have uh, eventually a universal coronavirus vaccine, but you know that, that will be a long time from now, I'm afraid, just like a universal flu vaccine. So I think we need now uh, is to create and to produce and to make available um, and to get into people's arms uh, a, a what might be called a multivariant uh, COVID vaccine. Um, more traditionally, it'd be called a multivalent, you know, a trivalent, a quadrivalent, like for influenza. Uh, each year, there's four different influenza viruses, 2A and 2B influenzas. Um, I think that's what's going to be uh, needed. Uh, I think the current vaccine is going to protect adequately for the uh, B1117 variant that was found first in the UK, but I'm really not that optimistic about the evolving uh, uh, variants from uh, first found in South Africa and Brazil. And certainly there are others, including in this country, there was one from California reported last week called CAL.20C. Uh, whether or not it is of major concern is, I don't know yet, uh, hasn't been reported, but there will be more. In my view, there already are more. So we need to create a template for how to respond and evaluate each variant. And we had, need to have a table uh, and both of these things I posted examples on, the, on my blogs earlier this month of variants versus vaccines. Um, and it's not just vaccines, it's one dose or two doses of the vaccine. How well, what percentage vaccine efficacy is there against each of the known and then the uh, still unknown but already circulating somewhere in the world uh, additional variants of concern. So let me start stop there, Joe, and turn it back to you and Lori. Yeah, thanks Joe, so much, Dan. Uh, Joe, you know, can, yeah. I, can I just say something? Yeah, because... please, go ahead, Lori. I mean, everything Dan said is just fabulous. I mean, it's spot on. I do agree with every single word of it. And I would just add a couple things. First, because we didn't have a strategic approach, we still don't, as I said. Operation Warp Speed was designed with one thing in mind, get vaccine out the door as fast as possible. And the parameters set by in agreement between the drug companies and FDA on what they needed to test and prove about their vaccine in order to get an emergency use uh, authorization, EUA, um, had nothing to do, zero to do with transmission. And I think this gets missed by everybody when they talk about these vaccines. There is no proof provided nor required of any of the drug companies to demonstrate that their vaccines actually prevent spread of the disease. Their, the test parameter, because they wanted to be able to do phase three trials in a matter of weeks instead of months. So the, 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 the proof, the, this claim of 95% protection and so on is all about whether or not the individuals progress to severe disease. It's not even, did they go asymptomatically infected? What they looked at was severe disease, hospitalization rates, death rates, and so on. So what we can say with confidence about the existing vac pool of vaccines, including ones back in the pipeline that are still heading into phase three or about to end their phase three trial, um, 
what we can say with confidence is these products will help keep you from dying. What we can't say is these products will stop epidemics. And now, as Dan points out, if people want to not take a second dose as a matter of policy or uh, dangerously here in the United States, now we're talking about moving it, the, the timeline out so you can go 42 days without your second dose. Just wait, they'll, soon they'll be saying 60 days is fine. Uh, 85 days is fine, whatever. You know, maybe next year you get your second dose. Well, as we take all these steps, we're, we're lowering the threshold of our targeted neutralizing antibody titers. So we know that just Pfizer, for example, between dose one and dose two, which I believe are separated by 21 days, uh, ideally, you have a 50-fold difference in antibody titer. So to go back to the antibiotic resistance model, right? Would you, Joe, would you give to your patient a dose of antibiotics that you knew would wipe out 10% of the bacteria in their bodies that were causing the disease, when you know perfectly well if you up the dose, you'll wipe out 100% of the bacteria. Of course you wouldn't, because you would be breeding drug-resistant strains of bacteria in that human's body, so that now you have to go to ever more expensive and more toxic products to treat them. We're kind of doing that experiment right now with vaccines. And politicians are making the choices. Boris Johnson is making the choice. Can we forego the second do dose? Um, based on nothing. And by the way, we don't really know all the details of what Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca have found in their trials because they've not been required to release to the public all of their data. So now today, the European Medicines Agency is meeting to decide whether or not to approve AstraZeneca's vaccine. And for the first time, we're hearing that there's some data that they've kept secret that shows it's only about 8% protective in people over 70. What? <laughs> Was anybody seriously considering using this? <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you both again. Let me just, before we uh, turn to uh, q and if we have any time, uh, let me ask you my overarching question. Let's pretend that the two of you are in charge of the global approach to pandemics, epidemics, et cetera. And you wanna um, start with concrete steps that would really enable us to do better. Dan, what do you think? I think it's uh, uh, almost impossible for me. Uh, my mind's just not uh, big enough, uh, but uh, I think you can argue from the recognized failures uh, and, and address those. I think that some of them are addressed in the 200-page uh, um, uh, uh, national strategic plan for, for COVID that uh, the new administration, uh, President Biden, uh, uh, put on their website uh, uh, on inauguration day or January 21st. Um, the seventh of the seven goals uh, is to uh, you know, prepare the world better for, and the USA better for, uh, for, for what's next, basically. Um, although the first part of that goal begins with something to the effect of a, a restore US leadership, which I, I understand that, but I think it's uh, part of the, problem again because we didn't appreciate and learn from immediately and applied lessons learned uh, from other countries uh, when when the, when this pandemic started um, I'd say Joe to try to answer the uh, maybe just in one more minute and then turn it back to you and Lori and I think that uh, the World Health Organization uh, um, uh, conundrum or, or I don't know what the right term is has to be a uh, addressed uh, now that we, the USA is back being a member of the WHO. Um, I think that uh, WHO is, is, it should be recognized it's, it's a political organization. That's, you know, it, that's its nature uh, uh, with all of its uh, member states. Um, I think the WHO Director General has a tremendous amount of power, power because of the international health regulations to, because only the Director General, previously Dr. Margaret Chan, now Dr. Tedros, can convene the emergency committee 
to advise on whether or not to declare a public health emergency of international concern. And then only that same person, the director general can um, make the declaration or not. And I think that they've been too slow, both you know, in the past and now, you know, for example, Ebola in West Africa, uh, honestly, I think Zika in, in, in Brazil and French Polynesia the year before, um, uh, and, and certainly for COVID um, when they first met January 22nd, 23rd. Uh, and that's what the high level panel uh, chaired by um, uh, Ellen Johnson Surley from Liberia um, and uh, Helen Clark from New Zealand uh, concluded that um, they waited too long to convene and they should have, uh, the director general should have announced the public health emergency of national concern. But aside from that, I think the United States has to do much, much better independently as well as in concert with, with the WHO. And, um, and we haven't done that in the past. I'm not sure how we'll do it. In part, uh, as Tip O'Neill said a long time ago, all politics is local. Uh, I would say that's the same for, um, you know, for planning for epidemics and most importantly, in, you know, recognizing and, and acting uh, when they first start, when, when the first clue is there. I've, I've, I've worked in Washington, D.C. for just over 30 years. And uh, I'm, 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 I recognize as a fact that um, 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 all pandemic preparedness is, is local. But the thing that gives me hope is that, um, and, and it sounds paradoxical, but uh, that there's been so much, and there continues to be and will continue to be so much fear and suffering and death and hunger uh, and suicides in, in our country, as well as around the world because of this pandemic, that the generation that's experienced, you know, younger than me, that's experiencing this now, will hopefully apply the the lessons that from their own suffering um, that uh, will make the coming pandemics less likely, but they'll still happen, so less severe. Let me stop there and thanks again. Thanks, Dan. So, Lori, let me put the world in your hands. What would you well, do? You know, for 13 and a half years, I tried to nibble at the edges of this problem from my position as a global health fellow in the Council on Foreign Relations. And I eventually decided that none of those approaches were going to work. I was involved in uh, three different reviews of WHO's performance, one of which was a large commission effort to assess the performance of WHO in the uh, Ebola crisis 2014. Uh, I think I've heard the phrase WHO reform so many times that, you know, you just get nauseous every time somebody says it yet again. <coughs> and frankly, excuse me, I think that we're all looking at the problem the wrong way. Forget reform of WHO. Forget creating national pandemic plans in America and templates for action and all of that. What really needs to happen, and I said this to Antonio Guterres asked me to address a meeting of the heads of all the UN agencies on this epidemic back in March before we went in lockdown. And I said then, you know, you're not prepared for the scale of what you're about to face. You don't have if you took the entire UN budget, every single agency and said, we're gonna put it all in this problem, it would be peanuts compared to the needs and to the economic cost of this epidemic. You need to think outside of the usual apparatus of funding and of streams of uh, response. It's, it's totally grossly inadequate. The UN can't handle it. And not much later, uh, George, I mean, uh, Larry Summers, our former Treasury Secretary, and uh, uh, Gordon Brown, the former exchequer uh, and Prime Minister of the UK, jointly put out a report that almost nobody noticed at the time, came out in April, I believe, that said, this is a $16 trillion pandemic. And that the cost to economies globally would resonate for more than a generation. That for many societies, the comeback would be uh, impossible, that it would just be actually uh, a, a remodeler of their economy. There wouldn't be a go back to where it was. And now we're already seeing that. I mean, think of just New York City, how many of these restaurants are ever going to come back? How many of the arts groups will ever be back again? So 
what I think fundamentally we have to ask is who's feeling the, the, the pain and still has enough money to come back from it? The corporate world. Look at who's, who's making money off this epidemic, Amazon and US, uh, UPS and all the big delivery companies and uh, the financial industry, Wall Street, they're making money hand over fist. We need to be able to say and have mechanisms in place to respond that say to uh, the, the multi-trillion dollar empire of the planet, if you want preparedness in the future, and you want rapid response, you have to pay for this. There has to be a way that we tithe the system, uh, tithe the profits that are being made off of epidemics to turn that money into meaningful programs of uh, surveillance and response. And I, not, you know, a hundred million here and a hundred million there, but multi-billion dollar permanent infrastructures that are global in scale and feed a global system of response. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Uh, Dan, Laurie, we are at the end of our hour. Um, thank you to all the listeners. Uh, there are some good questions in the Q&A. We'll have to leave those for the speakers to take a look at. Uh, the, um, the next session will begin at 11.05. It will be preparing the next generation of pandemic responders. We hope everybody can join that. But let me once again thank Daniel Lucy and Laurie Garrett for a wonderful discussion and presentation.